When you ask a beauty contestant, I'm sorry, let me try again. When you ask a beauty contestant what she thinks the most important thing for our world today is, or what is the one thing she wishes the most for, what is the answer? World peace. Good. World peace. <laughs> you know what? I used to make fun of that, but I'm. Lately, you know, I'm reconsidering just how right that response is. Of all the things that we can want, especially this time of year with our Christmas list and our gift <coughs> and all of that, the one thing that would make our life here on earth better than anything, except for when Jesus returns, would be what it is Just think about it for a minute. No more wars. No more soldiers coming home to their families with broken bodies and broken minds. Or worse, coming home in boxes. No more bodies blown to bits, innocent women, children, and men being the collateral damage of someone's aggression. No more violence on our streets. The gangs would turn into social clubs that went about doing service projects, you know, helping others instead of robbing them and killing them and one another. And no more random killings. People with twisted minds and agendas just opening fire on innocent people. No more violence in our homes. No more battered spouses or children living in fear of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. No more divorces. No more broken homes and single parents. Instead, couples would remain faithful to one another and would work out their differences instead of turning to lawyers and coming before judges. No more hunger or homelessness. No more children going to bed with empty stomachs. And no more people trying to find a safe place to sleep in the woods or behind buildings. I mean, we could just go on and on and on here and paint a picture of what this world would look like if we had world peace. Well, we've been given a picture this morning in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah. It's a passage that's known as the Peaceable Kingdom. You'll probably get at least one Christmas card this year with that beautiful little image of the lion and the lamb and the little children running around in midst of The description is, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cooper's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the city. It's a beautiful picture of a world that's free of danger and of fear. It's really what the world was meant to look like before the fall before sin had entered in and destroyed everyone and everything. God gave his word to Isaiah at a really dark time in Israel's history, a very dark time in Israel's history. It was when the powerful Assyrian army was ravaging the promised land, going through and leaving just a wake of death and destruction. It was, it's been called the first Holocaust of the Jews, and that's the period of time that Isaiah lived in, from 740 to 700 B.C. During that 40 years, Assyria repeatedly attacked the nation and killed most and then hauled the rest of the people off into captivity. So it must have been a living nightmare. I can't even imagine how awful that would have been. But God spoke this word of hope to encourage his people through his prophet Isaiah, that no matter how destructive the forces of human nature can be, God's promises are still more powerful. It's a word of hope for them when they needed it. And it's still a word of hope for us today. That the promise of peace will one day come in all of the fullness that Isaiah described in this passage. It's also a promise of the peace that has already come because of, my, of the Messiah, because of Jesus. And we get a description of him in this as well. This is a well-known a well and recognized messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. And if you're interested in following along, we're in Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to start at the beginning of that chapter. Even the Jewish scholars proclaim that this is a messianic prophecy. So it gives us a picture of what God was trying to tell us about this coming one, who, is, who we know to be Jesus. Isaiah 11, starting at the first verse. It's a page number. Uh, six, eight, six, eight, six. Six, eight, six. Great. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, Jesse was the father of King David. 
and, and of course all the prophecies about Messiah would be that he would come from the line of David. So why is Isaiah not talking about David but his father Jesse? It gives us a hint, a, a clue about the origin of this coming Messiah, the nature of his coming. The nation of Israel was um, often referred to figuratively as a tree. And when the Assyrians came and then the Babylonians after them <coughs> and brought the nation into exile, it was as if that tree had been felled. But God spoke through this prophet that from the stump would look like total devastation, like they'd been cut off entirely. From the stump would come a tender shoot, a righteous branch. And, and of course, that shoot was Messiah coming out of what looked like devastation. And he would, be, he would be born into the royal family of David. But David's father, Jesse, was never a king. So by referring to Jesse and not David, the people would have, should have known to look for Messiah not to come from a kingly household, but from very humble origins. And that, of course, is exactly how Jesus came to us. As a, a small child and a, to very poor parents born that night in a stable in Bethlehem. He lived his life without all the trappings of royalty. He didn't ever even have a home in his adult life. He just wandered as an itinerant preacher and benefited from the generosity of those in his, in his life. He, he came as, as unlike any king we could ever imagine or have ever seen. And we're told that this branch would bear fruit, a life that was not like any other life either. Look at verse 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord would rest on him, meaning it would remain upon him, which was unusual in the Old Testament. The Holy, the Holy Spirit used to come and, and, and give people the ability to do a certain task and then leave. But on the servant of the Lord, the spirit would remain. And these qualities would mark what his life would be like here on earth. And also the characteristics of the kingdom that he was ushering in. Wisdom. The ability to see things as they really are. Understanding. Being able to understand the relationship between things. Counsel. A willingness to listen and give advice with wisdom. Power. The ability to influence and to enact change. Knowledge. Knowing all things. He was God. He knew all things. And the fear of the Lord. Always being centered upon the will of the Lord. Now look at verses 3 through 5. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. It speaks of Jesus' heart for the poor and the downtrodden, the least of these. And his ability to look past external appearances and to see into the heart and to really understand <clears throat> the heart of the issue and the heart of the person. We saw these characteristics during his earthly ministry and they're signs of his coming kingdom as well. So as citizens of that kingdom, these are the things that should be reflected in our lives. When Jesus first came at the incarnation, he showed us what life was meant to be looked like, what love really looks like, and how to live in accordance with God's plan and His will. He, he gave us a picture of the fullness of life in Him. We see that when we look at Jesus. And during His time on earth, He made it possible for us to share that life. For you and for me and for everyone who would believe in Him. He dealt with the sin that was the cause of destroying the peace that God had intended for this world and for His people in it. He took that sin upon Himself and took the punishment it deserved upon Himself at the cross. So by faith, when we place our trust in Him, we receive the Holy Spirit, His own Spirit within us, His very life within us. And we begin to walk in the way that He said, the way of truth and righteousness and peace. He made it possible for us to have all that fullness of life that He showed in His own life. And you know, because of that, Every now and then we get little glimpses of what that piece of the kingdom might be. <clears throat> little glimpses, sometimes in our own hearts, in the midst of anxiety or fear, when we turn to the Lord and trust in Him, and we, we, we find that peace that passes understanding. We get a little glimpse of that piece of the kingdom. 
Sometimes it's in our own homes or in our families when you hear those words, I'm sorry, please forgive me. When somebody decides it's not so important to be right, it's more important to be reconciled. Sometimes we see it in our communities. I think most recently was during the hurricane when communities came together to help one another out after all the devastation of the storm. There have even been glimpses of this peace in the world. One particular incident I want to talk about this morning was on Christmas Eve in 1914. For one miraculous moment during World War I, there was a temporary halt in the fighting between the Germans and the Allied forces. It's only five months into the war and over 800,000 men had already been killed or wounded. Just five months into the war. Tremendous devastation. On December the 7th, 1914, Pope Benedict the 14th, the 15th suggested a temporary pause of the war for the celebration of Christmas. But the warring countries wouldn't hear about it. They refused to create any sort of official ceasefire, even with the Pope's plea. But the soldiers on Christmas that year decided that they would enact an unofficial truce. After the sun, when the sun went down that Christmas Eve, there's kind of a hush fell over the battlefield. And one side began to sing Christmas carols. And in the stillness, the other side in the trenches could hear and join in. And they began to sing Christmas carols to one another across the battlefield. And when light first dawned on that Christmas day, it was some of the German soldiers that made that first step. They came out of their foxholes and called out Merry Christmas in the language of the Allied troops, showing that they were bearing no arms. And of course, first the Allied troops thought it was a trick. But when they realized they were not armed, they too came out and joined <coughs> the battlefield. Instead of fighting, peace broke out. And they wished each other Merry Christmas, and they sang more songs. There's even a, a documentation that they had of a soccer game between opposing forces. I mean, it was, it was a miracle. After, after hundreds of thousands of deaths, for peace to break out like that, almost spontaneously, they exchanged cigarettes and candy, you know, as Christmas gifts. And it didn't, it didn't go across the entire battlefield, but just for several stretches of the mile, they said they could still hear fighting going on further down. But in that one area, there was peace. Sadly, of course, it didn't last. The war resumed when fresh troops came, and the, the commanding officers declared that any more such fraternization between opposing sides would be considered an act of treason. So it put it into it. But for that one brief moment, we saw a miracle of Christmas. And what an appropriate time to celebrate the Prince of Peace being born into the world. You know, that story just gives me so much hope that deep within each and every heart, there is this desire, this longing for peace. Because each and every person bears the handprint of his creator. That's the desire that he has for us. It was the original plan for his world and for each and every one of us. Because there will come a day when all the wars will cease when all the wrongs will be set right, when all the injustices will be made right, when there'll be no more oppressed or poor, and evil will be brought to an end. God promised in Scripture to send that righteous branch, that shoot from the stump of Jesse. And his promise came true in Jesus. He was faithful to that promise. And there are more promises still about when he returns in glory to judge the living and the dead. And we can, we can trust that that promise will be fulfilled as well. That's why we make our Eucharistic declaration, Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. It's our declaration of our trust in God's promises. You know, this world can be a very, very <coughs> dark place at times. People are living in fear, both of things real and things imagined. When Jesus first came, he said, I am the light of the world. And his light shone bright. And it covered every, everything. And, and how appropriate that at Christmas we celebrate with light, candles and Christmas trees and, and decorations that are all filled with light, remembering that promise and that gift that he gave us of his own life. And in John's Gospel, it declares, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When he returns, that light will shine more brightly still, and there'll be no place that's not touched by it, no dark corner left in the dark.
John also wrote in his revelation that on that great day, night will be no more. That in the fullness of God's kingdom, we will need no light or lamp or sun because God himself will be our light. Can you imagine no more need for the sun? <laughs> can't even picture that. And as Christians, what did Jesus say about us? You are the light of the world. Because we bear his life and light within us, we too now are lights of the world. And we hold out that light to everyone. Those that are still in darkness, to share with them the hope and the promise that God will again come and that there will be peace. I want to close with a prayer by St. Francis de Sales that reminds us of the power of that peace in our life through the gift of Jesus. Let us pray. Be at peace. Do not fear the changes of life. Rather, look to them with full hope as they arise. God, whose very own you are, will deliver you from out of them. He has kept you hitherto, and he will lead you safely through all things. And when you cannot stand it, God will bear you in his arms. Do not be afraid of what may happen tomorrow. The same everlasting Father who cares for you today will take care of you then and every day. He will either shield you from suffering or give you unfailing strength to bear it. Be at peace and put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginations. Amen. Amen.